And let us begin tonight talking about jobs. There is an article on my website. If you just go to harrybrown.org and do the links to articles and websites mentioned on the show, you'll see an article about the exporting jobs scam, which is the big cause du jour, the big scandal of the day, greedy corporations sending jobs offshore. And you can read there why the people who are commenting on it, politicians, TV commentators, whoever, all have it wrong, and only I have it right, of course. But I want to talk about another aspect of jobs tonight, the jobs that George Bush has failed to create, as the Democrats put it, those wondrous jobs that Ronald Reagan created during his term in office and Bill Clinton boasted about during his term in office. And the question is, why is there unemployment? Why are jobs not available for a lot of people who want to work? And to understand that, we need to look at a couple of economic principles. And I know economics seems like a dry subject. I remember when I was 20 years old, I was stationed in the Army on a desert island in the Pacific. I managed to read about 100 books during that one year that I was on the island, probably even more than 100 books, because I had very little to do. But I tried to read about economics, among other subjects that I studied there. And every time I got into this book, I never got past the first chapter because I just kept falling asleep. And the way it's presented in college and the way it's presented in high school when it is presented is as a pretty dull subject. But economics is really a fascinating subject, and we use it every day of our lives. So let's talk a little about economics. The basic principles of economics are these. First of all, resources are limited. That means we only have so much time. There are only so many natural resources that we can get out of the ground or off the trees or anyplace else because of the limitation of time that we have. So resources are always limited. There is only so much that we can use at any given time. There are only so many people, only so much knowledge, only so many raw materials, only so much time. At the same time, principle number two comes into play, and that is that desires are unlimited. That means we never can get enough. Whatever our station in life, whatever our point in life, every day of our lives, there are things that we want that we can't have. And when we get the things that we want, it just creates desires for additional things. The richest man in the world has things that he wants that he can't get his hands on. Desires are always unlimited. It is the nature of human beings to be working to try to replace one condition with a better condition. That is the nature of human action. And it applies always to all people. And that is what makes us human. But we have these two principles at work. Resources are limited. Desires are unlimited. There are never enough resources to satisfy all the desires. That's true of me as an individual or you as an individual. It's true of our nation as a nation. It's true of a business as a business. It is true of an organization of any kind. It is true of the world that resources are always in short supply compared to the desires that resources could fulfill. Now, if that's the case, if there are always desires that are unfulfilled, if there are always things that people want that they can't have, if you carry that to its logical conclusion, there should always be a job for anyone who wants to work. Think about that for a moment. If there are always unfulfilled desires, then you can always use somebody to help you satisfy some of those desires that you don't have the time, the energy, the knowledge, and other resources to satisfy on your own. There is always a need for more people to help satisfy those desires. That's why immigration is not the terrible scourge that so many conservatives think it is. Because we can always use more people in this country to help us get the things that we want. And every immigrant who comes across the border not only brings a supply of labor, which we need desperately to satisfy some more of our unfilled desires, but he also brings his own desires. And so he is demanding things that we produce. But that's another subject. What is important is that there are always unfulfilled desires. There's always a need for more human resources along with other resources. And so there should always be a job for anybody who wants to work. And it doesn't matter whether we think the country is in a depression. It doesn't matter whether prices are rising or falling or wages are going up or going down. There's always a need for more people to help satisfy the desires. Now, the only question is, at what price? What are the terms of trade? If somebody says, hey, I've got all sorts of things I could have you help me do. If you want to work some more hours, I'll be glad to have you work and I'll pay you 10 cents an hour. Well, given today's standard of living, today's price levels and so forth, you wouldn't accept a job at 10 cents an hour. So the only real thing that can hold back the seeking of work and the desire to do something is the term of trade, the pay that's going to come with it. What is being offered in exchange for one's labor? And there we have the crux of unemployment. At some price, everybody ought to be able to work. Now, not everybody can make $300,000 a year. Not everybody can be a Kobe Bryant and make $10 million a year. But everybody ought to be able to make some kind of living commensurate with the value that he has to offer others. 
And if he doesn't have much value to offer others, he can work at an unskilled labor job and in the meantime acquire skills and talents that he might be able to offer to others to elevate his standard of living. So we come back again to the question, why should there be any unemployment at all? There really shouldn't be. The only reason somebody should be unemployed in a free market is because he doesn't want to accept the kind of work that is available or he doesn't want to accept the wage that is offered for that kind of work. And this is a real phenomenon. I mean, somebody uh, works at something for 20 years and then that something goes out of demand. When automobiles came along, the horse and buggy disappeared, and people who had spent 20 or 30 years making buggy whips found that they were no longer in demand, and they didn't want, in many cases, to become auto mechanics, and so they had to either go into an entire new field or be out of work, and that can happen. But that is an individual's choice. He is not forcibly unemployed. He is voluntarily unemployed under those circumstances. So what could possibly cause unemployment? Well, unemployment can be caused when the terms of trade are forcibly imposed in such a way that employer and employee cannot make a deal together. And this can come about in several different ways. The most obvious way is the minimum wage law. Somebody starting out working on his first job might be worth 4 or $5 an hour to an employer. But the government says nobody can work unless he's worth at least $6 an hour. And this means that an employer could only take on an employee who's worth only $4 an hour as a charity case. But if he's in business to make money, he can't do that. And so he simply cannot employ a four-hour-an-hour worker at $6 an hour because he would be losing money. So the minimum wage law denies a lot of people at the lower end of the ladder. And, of course, the minimum wage law is usually justified on the basis that it's going to help the people at the lower end of the ladder. But that assumes that employers are going to intentionally lose money on those workers. And since they won't, those workers become unemployed. A second way that unemployment is caused is through the government's aiding labor unions to impose unrealistic demands on companies, which, if the companies accede to, mean that any non-union workers need to be laid off in order to make up for the losses the company will suffer with the union workers. Or they need to be laid off in order to automate those jobs in, in a way to try to reduce the number of employed people that have to be paid the union wages. The government helps these labor unions through a number of ways, most prominently by negotiating settlements through the National Labor Relations Board, which is always stacked in favor of the labor unions against the businesses, just as the other agencies of the government are often stacked with members of people who favor the industries that they're supposed to be regulating. There are other ways. Just by imposing unrealistic taxes, unrealistic regulations on businesses, they can create conditions where employees cannot be hired. In a free market, a totally free market where the government doesn't intervene with regard to jobs, wages, any of these things, not imposing payroll taxes on employers, not telling employers whom they must hire and whom they are not allowed to fire and what kind of a diversified workforce they need and what kind of working conditions they must provide for the employees. In a totally free market, involuntary unemployment would really disappear. And if you think that's a pipe dream, all you have to do is to examine history a little. In the 19th century, for instance, when the government didn't have the power to intervene in wages and in working conditions and so forth, what happened? Well, we had occasional depressions, but the depressions were not marked by large increases in unemployment. The depressions were usually caused by banking panics, which created problems for bank depositors, but did not throw a lot of people out of work. The first time that we had a depression in which work, in which jobs were lost and people were involuntarily unemployed on any large scale was in 1929. The depression started and Herbert Hoover marshaled every single resource of the government that he could to try to get the country out of the depression through governmental means. He pressured big business to not lay off workers, but more important, to not lower wages. Even though the money supply was shrinking rapidly, the price level was plummeting, and prices dropped by 25%, as did the money supply between 1929 and 1933, an enormous jolt to the economic system. And Hoover pressured these companies not to lower their wages. Well, under those circumstances, they had no choice but to lay off many, many workers. And then Roosevelt came in castigating Hoover for his big government policies, and that's how Roosevelt got elected, because Democrats traditionally were the party of small government up to that point. But, of course, Roosevelt reneged on all his promises to cut the bureaucracy, to cut taxes and so forth, and did just the opposite. And with all the Great New Deal programs and with all the historical myths about Roosevelt pulling us out of the Depression, the fact is that at the end of the 1930s, unemployment in this country was 
was still at 19 percent because government cannot create jobs. Government cannot solve economic problems. Government can only make them worse. And if we would get the government completely out of the job market, get the government completely out of the wages and payroll taxes and all of these things and all the regulations, then we would have a free market in employment and you would know that you could always get a job of some kind. Maybe not the job you want the most in the world if conditions were to change, but you could always get a job that could support your family. And you would know that the kinds of unrest that come from people being out of jobs and unable to get work would virtually disappear from this country. And what we would have is much greater harmony. And if you're thinking, gee, in the 19th century with no regulation, that's why they had sweatshops and so forth. No, that's not why they had sweatshops. They had sweatshops because the technology did not exist at that time to provide wonderful air-conditioned facilities for everybody. But because the market was free... The market was moving in that direction. People no longer had to work 16 hours a day on the farm. They could work 12 hours a day in a factory or an office. And then eventually they could work 10 hours a day. And then Henry Ford came along and provided the eight-hour day at a dollar an hour. And his, his competitors had to do the same in order to keep up with him. And then people in other industries did the same so that they could get the best possible workers. And conditions just kept improving long before the government stepped into this field. Well, let's see what people out in the real world have to say about all this. Let's talk first with Steve in Bradenton, of Florida. Good evening, Steve. Good evening, Mr. Brown. How are you? I'm just fine. Thank you for calling. I don't think we've heard from you before. No, you haven't. I want to thank you for your program. I've enjoyed it for several weeks. Um, I agree with you on a lot of things, but I disagree with you on one very important thing. Uh, you have neglected to enter into the concept of supply and demand, and our government has increased the supply of uh, workers, and as a result of in, in letting workers come in from foreign countries, the supply and demand of basic law of economics has kicked in, and prices uh, for hourly labor has gone down. Well, you're, you're saying that the immigrants coming into the country increase the supply of labor, correct? Exactly. Don't they also increase the demand for products? No, they do not. Oh, they don't? They don't buy anything? They no, don't if eat? You're, if, you, if you're a farmer and you farm 40 acres of cucumbers and you need people to harvest those cucumbers, that's a finite number of cucumbers. And if you cannot find anybody to harvest those cucumbers for you, then you will pay more to get people to come in and take those cucumbers off your land and take them to the market. If you're a software programmer and uh, you're generating software and you cannot find people, then you will pay more until you can find the right kind of person to come in and code for you. Well, basically what I'm saying, Mr. Brown, is that the United States government is the enemy of the people. The government has opened the doors to foreign workers, and that increase of supply at every level has lowered the cost of wages of the American worker. And uh, it has happened at every point of the spectrum from people who pick cucumbers to people who write code for software. But we still come back to the basic principle of economics, that desires are unlimited. There couldn't be enough people in this country to satisfy all the desires of the people in this country. The, the desires will always outrun our resources, so there will always be a need for more people, and we will never meet that need completely, no matter how many people come into the country. And the only reason that these people seem to be taking jobs away from Americans is because the government makes it so difficult for people to get together. Now, for instance, one of the common complaints is, that the Mexican workers coming in will work for less than Americans will. Well, of course they will in some cases. If you wanted me to mow your lawn for you or take care of your shrubs, I wouldn't do it for less than $100 an hour. But fortunately, there are people around who will do it for $5 an hour or $10 an hour or $20 an hour, and these things can get done. But that doesn't mean I'm out of work. It just means I need to either change my valuation of myself or find people who want to pay me $100 an hour for doing something that's actually worth $100 an hour. But there's always something that I can do. And if somebody puts me out of one job, there are plenty of other jobs in the world. They may not be thought of at the moment as jobs, but somebody needs something. Everybody needs something. And this is where I just have to look to find the employment that I want. That's the problem, is that we, look, we don't look at the fact that demand is always unlimited while supply is always limited, so there can never be uh, so many people working that nobody else can get a job. The very fact that these people are working creates an additional demand for more products and services. Everybody who is working needs things. This and is where, this is where I, I, I have a great deal of respect for you, but this is where I think that you are wrong. The supply has, is no longer limited. The United States government has, has made the supply abundant by opening up the, the borders of our country. Our borders are porous, and the supply is now unlimited, much to the delight of mainly the, of the Republicans who are the uh, holders of, of the, uh, and the CEOs of the major corporations. They love it when there is a supp an unlimited supply of workers. Do you have as everything? Result, they don't have to pay workers as much, and that's my point. Do you have everything that you need in life? Of course not. Okay, then there's a demand. You have a demand for, for more products and services to be made, which but is going to need more, more I people. I don't have the wherewithal to satisfy my demand, and I don't have that because I am limited by what I can earn, and I am limited by what I can earn because of what they pay me. 
and what they pay me is a result of the supply of people who share my skills and talents and compete for my job. Therefore, I have to lower my demand for wages because of all the other people who are equal to me. And they are equal to me because the government has let more people into the marketplace. And, and my wages have now gone down. And as a result of that, so has the entire standard of living for the United States. Well, we've gone around in a circle here, so I won't try to prolong this. We'll look for another well, opening here. I think your here. point is irrelevant. No, and it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not irrelevant because if you don't understand that resources are limited and desires are unlimited, there is no basis upon which to make any economic evaluations, and there is no way to understand economics in any shape that, or form. That point of relevancy is is immaterial to the problems of the people of the United States. We are facing economic ruin. What is relevant? What is relevant is our wages. Our wages have gone down. Our wages have not kept pace. And you think it's all due to immigration? It, absolutely. All in, because our government has let people come in and take it over jobs, and that increase of supply of workers has, has kicked in, and we are no longer making the kind of money. CEOs' wages have increased tremendously in the past 20, 30 years, and our wages, the workers' wages, have increased only 5 or 10%. And it's because of supply and demand, basic laws of economics, and our government has let these people come in. Well, you are giving the fodder to the demagogues who love to tell people that they're being taken advantage of by immigrants, by CEOs, or by other people. But the, We're being the, taken advantage of by the United States government. Well, that's true. And our United States government is, is a kowtowing to those corporations who uh, submit political contributions to them and do their deeds. Well, I wish I could give you an exact figure, but I'm aware that the number of immigrants coming into the country every year, uh, while it seems like a tidal wave, is really not that great a number as compared to the number of people who are already here working, which is in the neighborhood of around uh, 100 million or so. And it, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I have worked in companies where there have been programmers from Pakistan, China, India, Bangladesh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and all of those jobs were once held by Americans. Let me ask you one question before we wind this up. Do you think Americans should not be allowed to drink French wine or to buy Italian shoes or to buy any products from overseas, uh, Japanese cars, for instance, or German cars? I think that's, the answer is no, but I think that's irrelevant. Well, I think it's completely relevant because it doesn't matter whether these cars are built by Germans in Germany or Germans in America or uh, Mexican food in Mexico or Mexican food in America. The fact of the matter is that what we are doing is taking advantage of a division of labor that exists in the world, and that division of labor knows no boundaries unless our government sets up boundaries and says that we cannot deal with anybody outside this country either by their coming into this country or by our buying products that are made outside the country Mr. by those Brown, people. You have just initiated the concept of patriotism. Are we Americans? Are we for the Americans? Are we for the American way of life? And are we protectorate of the Americans that are, are share our, our neighborhoods and our values? Or are we willing to open up our doors to people who do not necessarily share our views and our, our culture and our religion? Well, the people in government don't share our views or our culture or, or our values. And, 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 yes, and that's what I'm saying. The American government is the biggest enemy of the American people. Well, I agree with that. But the fact of the matter is that it makes no more sense to close the doors to immigrants than it does to close the doors to foreign products because they're just two versions of the same thing. But I appreciate your call, Steve, and I welcome your calls in the future on anything you either want to agree or disagree on or to give us an insight that we wouldn't see otherwise. Now let's talk to another Steve who's in West Wego, Louisiana, if I've pronounced that correctly. It's Did... actually pronounced West Wego. West just Wego. Like yes, West okay. Wego. Okay. Okay. Just, uh, like, just like everybody did. Everybody went west. Okay. And now everything's going Except east. you. You're still in Louisiana. Yes. Everything's going east now. Everything's that... going, all our jobs, we're, we're, we're letting, uh, you first, the first guy, Steve, he, I mean, uh, some of the stuff he was saying, the majority of the stuff he was saying is true. But what he left out was, and what you leaving out is, economic development, right? You bring in more labor, correct? You also... Lower your wages because I got snapped by it. I just got beat up twice. I was in the seafood industry, okay? Ex imported shrimp coming in dropped the price of the American shrimp that we were catching. In Louisiana, we're not allowed to catch wild redfish, okay? But I can buy imported redfish from Taiwan, okay? Okay, but that's, that's the fault of the U.S. government well, uh, with its crazy regulations. Exactly. And here's another thing. We are letting immigrants come in, but we're also importing jobs. I mean, companies. Uh, how, do mean, how do you mean? How do you mean? Leaving America to go find cheap labor to where in Mexico, Zenith Television. I remember when Zenith used to be made in America. Zenith why, why is now do made in Mexico. Why are companies leave? Uh, why? Yes. Why are they the building government. factories across the, across other parts of the world? Because they can dump toxic waste anywhere over there, over here. Like you said, with the sweatshirts, with with, with the sweatshops. Back in the days, you didn't have air conditioning back in the day. Okay, mm -hmm. but if once you put air conditioning in, and you plug that unit, that air conditioning in to the wall. You must do one or two things. You must either lay off your employees or increase the cost of your product 
to cover for the air conditioner. All right, what you're saying is labor costs are cheaper overseas, correct? Don't you agree? Yes, I do agree, but I have to I mean, tell look you... how many steel factories we lost to Japan because okay, we buy well, Japanese steel. But the Japanese have higher wages than the Americans do. Why is it that the Japanese are not sending their plants over here to produce things that are then going to be sent back to Japan to be purchased the way Americans are doing building plants in Thailand to produce products that will then be imported back in the United States? And another question, as long as I have been alive... Wages have been higher in the United States, considerably higher in the United States, than in Thailand or Indonesia or India or any of those third world Asian if, countries. If, if, why if, is if, it that 40 or 50... wages are so high, why are we then, and I watched the program on this, why are they taking over the credit card situation? All of the processing, any kind of processing paperwork, any kind of credit card, Visa, MasterCard processing. What you're saying is that, that what you're saying is they're, that you're saying they're putting that processing overseas. All right, but you said it was because of the labor cost, the cheaper labor overseas. But my question is, why, since this condition has existed for 50, <laughs> let me finish okay. my question. Okay. Why is it that 40 or 50 years ago, when there was the great disparity then between wages in America and wages in Thailand, Indonesia, or India, why weren't companies exporting jobs to Thailand, Indonesia, and India 40 or 50 years ago in order to save money? I don't think we had the means of the, the necessary. I don't think we had the means of capable to do that. Now we have communication that you can talk on cell phones. I can call China, sitting in my living room on a cell phone. 50 years ago. You probably had to have 16 operators connect you to China. No, but there were telexes, and there was Western Union, and there were other means of communication, now, even but, though we didn't have email or faxes. But, but even computers now took away printing presses. I know a guy that's unemployed used to be a print set. Now, being that everybody uses computers to print their own stuff, he's out of a job. Mm -hmm. You see, technology also puts people out of work. Labor costs may cost more overseas, but they don't have to pay unemployment insurance. They don't have to pay Social Security, and they don't have to pay... Medical insurance. Of course not. Companies hire other people here. There, there are labor companies out there that work cheaper than the, that pay cheaper than the company I work for. They hire extra labor, okay, and pay less money to the labor company. So they save money because they don't have to pay Social Security. Right. They don't have to pay. No, we got that. Insurance. We got. We got that. No, and no, no, no. That's here in America. Also. Well, see? they do have to pay legally. Have to pay Social Security to anybody they Somebody employ. Somebody else does. I beg your pardon? Somebody else does. Like if you owned a company, okay, and you make, say you make boots, all right, and you got uh, six people that work with you, okay, you have a six, you have a six, uh, uh, you have yeah, six go ahead, ladies, and you need somebody to sweep the floors, but you don't want to pay them, all you're going to pay them is $6 an hour. So what you do is you call a labor company. And the labor company pays Social Security pay to the people the they sent over. You don't. Yes, I know, but somebody does. All right, we, we understand, and I think nobody listening to this show would disagree with you, that the government imposing all of these taxes and all of these other things is the principal cause of unemployment in this country. And when you talk about people getting cheaper employees overseas, remember that they are offering those people overseas better jobs than they would have in the absence of those American companies, or the American companies wouldn't be able to hire anybody. But why Thanks. aren't American companies moving out of America? Because it's become too expensive to do business in America with all the regulations that have been piled on American companies, but whether they're environmental companies? regulations, whether they're employment regulations, whether they are why working why do foreigners want to come here? Why do the foreigners want to come here? Why do people from Mexico want to come here? They think that they can do better here than they can in Mexico. Thanks for calling, Steve. Let's go to New Orleans and talk with Jeffrey. Good evening, Jeffrey. All right, Harry, there are three things I have to point out of these callers. One, some segments of this population are so controlled by government, the government dictates who gets the jobs. And I'm referring, of course, to blind people, where 11,500,000 blind people exist, but only one quarter of them are employed because the government dictates through legislatures and through counselors who gets the jobs and who doesn't. Are there 11 million blind people in America? That's correct. That's official government statistics. Oh my gosh. Now, number two, what people have forgotten is that there's a, there are two laws in economics. The law of supply says the more you produce, the higher your cost. The more law of demand says the more you make, the lower your rate of return or the lower the price gets. The problem with the guy with the cucumbers referred to earlier is that if the cucumber price is too low, he can't hire the workers and the cucumbers don't get harvested. Number three, have you ever heard of OPIC? The Overseas Private Investment Corporation. That's a government agency? That's a government agency that subsidizes the transfer of technology and factories from America overseas to other countries and is helping corporations and inducing corporations to send their plants over to such countries as the People's Republic of China. And we've gone over that business where the Chinese government represses its population severely through limitations of all kinds, and yet they're putting, the factories are going over there where we're partnering with, with Communist Party members in China to have the factories sent over there. And the result is that you don't see the companies in the U.S. fighting against all these federal regulations. You never see General Motors fighting to get rid of the minimum wage or the right. laws, etc. I understand. Jeffrey, we're going to have to break now for the news. Stay tuned, folks. We will be back in just a few minutes, and we got another hour to go. This is Harry Brown. 
All right, let's continue this spirited discussion. We'll talk now with Eugene in Akron, Ohio. Good evening, Eugene. Yes, first thing, you mentioned you were on a uh, Pacific Island. Uh, do you remember the name of that? Oh, yes, I'll never forget the name of it. It was Enoitak, where they have the H-bomb test. That's where I was in the late 70s. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, the, it was Lojo Island that I were at, and I used to preach libertarianism there, including your book, this in the late 70s. Oh, my heavens. I wish we had the time to reminisce about it. It would be a lot of fun, but, of course, it will be of no interest to anybody else listening to this show. Right, I'll, I'll email you something. Okay, oh, good. Okay, my main thing is... Do you think it's time we get out of the jobs paradigm? Because what I'm looking at, we don't really want a job. We want a means of creating, acquiring, possessing, and most important, enjoying wealth. And if some country is nice enough to send us lots of cars for not, and not have us pay or steal or whatever, we can just do something to enjoy all this good stuff. Uh, maybe it's time we have a paradigm shift. Yeah, that's a very good point. And by wealth, of course, you don't mean just piles of money or piles of gold. You mean uh, piles of things that you want. Right, right. C- CDs and television and all kinds of other things. And that brings up an interesting thing. Back around 1980, I appeared at an investment seminar in London, and it just so happened that the person who preceded me on the platform gave a speech in which he said that by the year 1990 or some date in the future, which has long since passed, there would be no more jobs in America, that everything would be coming from Japan, that the Japanese would be supplying everything, and so Americans wouldn't be able to have jobs anymore. And when I got up, I said, my God, Nirvana, it's finally come. We're going to get all these things free of charge from the Japanese. Isn't that wonderful? Exactly. That wasn't Jeremy Rifkin, was it? <laughs> no, it wasn't, but it does sound like him. Okay, let me finish up by saying that you know one of the great jobs destroyers of the last 50 years was the polio vaccine. But fortunately, no one's complained about that. <laughs> That's a very good point. You're absolutely right. What we are doing is trying to increase our standard of living. Right. And we shouldn't be doing it in a way that says it must conform to whatever was the way it was done five years ago, 50 years ago, or 500 years ago. Right. Thanks so much, Eugene. I appreciate the insights. Okay, see you later. You bet. Uh, right along with that, let me interrupt the calls with an email from Dave, and I have had a number of emails on this, and I don't know whether we'll get to them. I hope I can get to them. But Dave says, Steve, the caller, was disappointed by his lack of earning power, which he blames on an excess supply of labor. What he is forgetting is the degree to which cheaper labor is holding prices down, making what money he does earn go farther. What is keeping Steve down financially, though, is several things. The high level of taxes, which robs Steve directly, the artificially high interest rates he must borrow at, which only in recent years have come down, caused by government-sponsored inflation, and the heavy load of regulations that his company must pay, which waste money that could otherwise have been paid to him. Immigration has always been a source of fresh, energetic, hungry workers, as the most hardworking, self-sufficient people were distilled from foreign countries to come to the U.S. However, this has been undermined by the present welfare state, which acts as a magnet for the lower, less industrious elements of any country's society. And the reason I wanted to mention this email from Dave is that he points out that this cheaper foreign labor means cheaper American products, and we are enjoying those cheaper American products, and as Eugene has just pointed out, it isn't jobs per se that we're concerned about, it isn't wages per se we're concerned about, it is what we can acquire with whatever jobs or whatever wages we have, and if both wages and prices go down, that's not a disaster. It's when wages go down and prices go up that you would have disaster. Let's talk now with Joe in Norfolk, Virginia. Good evening, Joe. Yes, hi, Harry. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, Before I get to the main point, I have a quote I'd like to share with you, and and, uh, it's so good, I think you must have said it. Uh, (laughs) But I'm sure you you may have heard it. Anyway, uh, it, it goes like this. Everyone is a capitalist. The only question is, who will control the capital? Hmm. Well, I didn't say that, but that's well, an interesting that, yeah. point. Yes, uh, I think the uh, first two callers, uh, the, the men who were uh, had a problem with the way that uh, uh, the government was constructing or deconstructing the job market in this country, were really sincere and really believed that they had thought through their arguments, and and, and that's great. But uh, I, I don't, I really don't think they have. I really think they lack a vision. I, uh, the last caller really hit the mark. They, uh, they lack a vision of what constitutes a job. Need to shift the paradigm on what is a job. Let me give you an example. I have a job today that less than 10 years ago you could not have conceived of. Most people in the world, 99% of the people in the world, would not conceive 10 years ago that I could do today what it is I'm doing and making a living at it. Do you want to tell us what it is? I sell stuff on eBay. Yeah. I, I decided some years ago that after 20-some years of working for other people in a few jobs, I didn't like that. I did not like working and sitting in an office, whether no matter what it was, uh, various occupations, And I saw this opportunity to go into business for a very minimal amount of money out of my home and and, and do rather well at it. And hundreds of thousands and soon millions of people are going to be doing the same thing. Whether it's auctioning things on eBay or competing in other kinds of Internet businesses, you're absolutely right. And that's a wonderful example because we can all visualize that very easily. Instead of talking in abstractions, you're talking about something that didn't exist 15 or 20 years ago and now is an enormous source of employment for people around the country. They cannot continue making buggy whips, but they can compete on eBay and other places. As a matter of fact, the woman without whom I could 
not survive. Namely, my wife, Pamela, has an Internet business called Vintage Bobbles, in which she sells vintage clothing and accessories. And not only did her business not exist for anybody 15 years ago, but 15 years ago, I couldn't get her to use a computer. <laughs> when, when we first got married, she put off, put off, put off. She, she was writing as I was and put off using my computer because it was just something foreign to her. And she could not imagine in a million years that she would ever be running a business on a computer. And here, 15 years later, she, too, was the queen of eBay. <laughs> exactly. I mean, 10 years ago, if I wanted to do something similar to what I'm doing today, I would have had to take the stuff that I have, set up a little uh, a stand in a flea market and do the best I could. <laughs> yes, that's, right. that's the way that works. Now, you know, I'm not making a fortune. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a living. But now I'm selling to people. I, I just sent something to Belgium, of, of all things, last week. Somebody bought a book on transistor radios that I purchased for almost nothing, and I sold for $10, and I sent it to Belgium. You know, the, the postage was more than $10. Right, but, but he paid the postage. He paid the postage, of course. Right, because, because he the, wanted something that you had. That's right, and, and I have a worldwide marketplace that did not exist. And, and the point of that is, um, uh, you know, no, what do they say in the stock market? Past performance is no proof of future performance. Absolutely. But, but it's a pretty good indicator. And uh, when you hand the economy over to the government in, 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 in any, any sense whatsoever. In any You're in real trouble, and I'm sorry I have to cut okay, you off, go but ahead. we're going to the commercial. All right, thank you, Harry. Joe, thanks so much for calling. A wonderful example. Thank you. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown. One thing that people on both sides of tonight's controversy seem to agree on is that somewhere in some way the government is responsible for the dislocations in the job market. Even those who hold the populist view that immigration is taking jobs away from Americans still realize that the Social Security taxes, the other payroll taxes, the regulations, and so on, are driving companies offshore, creating problems uh, in trying to employ people in this country. So we all agree on that, and there's no argument there, I don't believe. Let's go now to Ocala, Florida, and talk with David. Good evening, David. Good evening, Harry. You almost pronounced Ocala, right? Oh, <laughs> I don't pronounce any town right. Hey, you did. You're one of my favorite folks, as always. Question for you. To, now, I, next to a drug prohibition, America's longest losing war, the embargo against Cuba, Castro's Cuba, to me is probably America's second longest losing failed war. And what I'd like to know is, perhaps you can enlighten us, how is it that America refuses to trade with or have any dealings with Cuba because they're communist, but yet one of our biggest trading partners is communist China? Well, I think that if we could investigate it far enough, we would find that there are people who profit heavily from the embargo on trade with Cuba. I don't know offhand who they are, and I haven't given more than a few seconds thought to it, but I'm sure that if you or I were to really dig into it, we would be able to identify some very influential, politically potent people People who are profiting from that embargo, just as we can probably find uh, plenty of people who are profiting from the open door policy with China. And we know that any time you turn anything over to the government, whether it was a scientific matter, a financial matter, a medical matter, a military matter, whatever it is that you turn over to the government automatically becomes transformed into a political issue to be decided by whoever has the most political influence. And that will never be you and it will never be me, so it is just absolutely futile and ridiculous to ever think that you are going to influence the government or that if you support some program because it sounds good, it's actually going to turn out the way that you expected. Well, that's more than you want to know about the Cuban embargo, but I can't help making that point because it's a principle that should never be ignored. And, of course, the Cuban embargo is really ridiculous. It has not brought Fidel Castro down after 40 years. It has not done anything except to make people in Cuba very, very mad at the United States. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because as a libertarian, I'm certainly no fan of uh, John Kerry. I didn't realize what a big drug warrior he was. And he was he's coming out now you know, supporting drug prohibition, of course, and supporting the embargo on Cuba. So I fired off an email to his uh, website and I said, I used to think you were just a two-time loser uh, in Vietnam <laughs> and the war on drugs. I said, but now you're supporting America, the three of America's longest losing wars. You're a three-time loser. You were a loser in Vietnam, you're a loser on the Cuban embargo, and you're a loser on drug prohibition. I said, God help America if you get elected. Well, plus he's a loser on uh, the war on terrorism, which while it is not yet one of America's longest wars, it certainly will be by the time it's over. <laughs> and Harry, one other quick thing. I know I have a lot of cold. I don't want to let my tongue keep wagging, but how do we get your message, libertarian message, that's so logical, that's so sensible? It's so frustrating to me because every week I listen to your show, I get inside, I learn. I've, and I, you know, I share these things with people, and they all agree with me, but they say, gee, I never heard of Harry Brown. I never heard of libertarians. All they hear is Bill and Hillary and Bush and Kerry. I mean, you turn on every, any TV show, all you see are the Democratic primary and Bush's rebuttals. Why no libertarian messages? Why aren't we getting through? Well, what can you, be done? you're almost answering your own question there. You just pointed out that you're talking to people, and they're agreeing with you, and they're saying, well, I never heard of libertarians before, let alone Harry Brown, who's not important in all of this. But the point is that more people now 
do hear these things, more people do understand it than did before. And you are one person, I am one person, and there are thousands and thousands of other people listening to this. Some of them think I'm nuts, but a lot of them are just like you and taking what sustenance we can develop on this show and carrying it to their friends and associates who also agree. The reason, of course, they don't see it on television uh, or any place else is because we have no chance to win elections with the election laws the way they are now. And the media understand that, so the media does not pay a lot of attention to us because we're not in a position to influence the outcome. But as we grow and grow, sooner or later, suddenly, uh, people are going to have to set up and take notice. And when that happens, then things will begin to change in this country. And I can't promise you that it even will happen. But it, it is very, very possible that it can happen. And for that reason, I will not give up hope, and I hope you don't give up hope well, either. I certainly won't. As I said, I hope you live to 120. I hope I live to be around to hear you that long. Well, thank you very much. I sure appreciate the kind words. Thank we'll be so back. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes after these messages. This is Harry Brown. Hello again. Harry Brown here. And let us now talk to Ed. And good evening, Ed. Tell, tell me where you are, will you? Waterville, Maine. Waterville, Maine. Yeah. Okay. Listen, you mentioned that you wouldn't work for less than 100 bucks an hour. If, if well, somebody, I, I'm willing to negotiate. <laughs> I was just going to say, if somebody offers you something for 90, could you give me a call? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. To, to take the job. Good for yeah. you. Right. So anyway. Um, An- another enterprising American heard from. Yeah. You know, um, there's an economist who's, who's no longer with us, who's better known than Ludwig von Mises in, in New England, and it's Scott Nearing. Do you know that, Scott? The name rings a bell, but I can't place it offhand. Well, he was a professor at Wharton School of uh, Business, and he opposed American entrance into World War One. So they fired him and charged him with sedition, and he was... Uh, That's where I've heard of him. Yeah. Well, he, he represented himself, and they found him not guilty by jury. So, but he was blacklisted for the rest, well, for most of the rest of his life, and he never did go back into uh, college teaching. So he got out of that altogether and went into uh, sugaring in Vermont. Sugaring? Yeah, and then uh, you, know, uh, you mean he grew sugar? How do you? How do you, What do you do? I know you don't pick sugar off the trees. What is it? Sugar cane? Yeah, sugar you do get sugar from trees in, in New England. Oh, is that where the cane grows? No, no, yeah, maple trees. Oh, maple trees. Okay, shows <laughs> shows shows how much I know. Uh, so he went into the sugar business, and uh, did he prosper? Well, he lived to 100. <laughs> well, that's good enough for me. And and, and his wife Helen lived to uh, 87, and and they both wrote a lot of books, and they were the they were the the, the father and and grandmother, or however you want to put it, of, of the Back to the Landers. And um, yeah, they they wrote about building with stone and and but but they concluded that you really couldn't influence the government and and if you tried you were only going to be disappointed and um, so you know up here he's he's our economist but I wanted to say one more thing about um, you mentioned Cuba mm-hmm. um, I met some people in Miami who claim to have done or, or claim to be doing business in Cuba and um, they're Israeli nationals and they you know Israel votes yearly to um, Embargo Cuba with the United States and the UN. So if you're looking for the people who may be responsible or, or may be benefiting, as you said, from that business, they sell tropical fruit. Are they in Israel and selling from Israel? No, they actually live between Miami and, and Havana or wherever it is that they live in Cuba, and they market all of. Um, well, this is what they say: they market all of Cubans, uh, Cuba's uh, tropical fruit. So there is somebody who's benefiting from the. Um, and, and I'm not saying it's just them, but somebody sure. benefits from the embargo. Oh yeah, of course. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate the information and also hearing about Scott Nearing. I did come across him in my research for the book I'm writing, The War Racket. He was one of the few people who didn't get convicted of uh, sedition or espionage in the First World War just for speaking out against the war. It's an interesting thing that in all those cases, there were two law- basic laws, the espionage law and then the sedition law, and not one person was, to the best of my knowledge, was ever convicted of spying against the United States, which is what you think espionage is. But Several thousand people were indicted, and most all of them convicted, and quite a few of them went to prison for speaking out against the war, speaking out against the draft, and they were convicted under the Espionage Act, which, as I say, did not convict a single person for spying against the United States. And a lot of people were convicted under the Sedition Act, too. All right, back to business. Let's go to Phoenix, Arizona, and talk with Ricky. Good evening, Ricky. Ricky, are you? Yes, hello there. I I, I listen to a lot of your shows, and I've I've actually uh, read two of your books, and I have three more on order. And I, I bought one for a friend of mine because she told me she was she was a social democrat, and I was like, no. <laughs> uh, I had a uh, uh, that was my comment, but I actually thought of a question while I was waiting here. And what do you think of copyright law, copyright law, like information copyrights and patents and stuff? Well, I think that intellectual property is important, and I have to say that as a personal matter, all my life I have tried to respect other people's intellectual property. I've tried to give credit to other people when I use their ideas, and I have even offered to pay people for ideas that I wanted to use, mm-hmm. but. 
I do not believe that anything is going to work well when it's the government administering it. Yeah. And so what you have, of course, are arbitrary decisions made by the government with regard to how long a copyright can last, how many times it can be renewed, and so forth. And it's even worse with patent law because you and I might independently come up with relatively the same idea, mm -hmm. but it all depends on who gets the patent office first, and the other one is just plain out of luck. He can't produce anything from it. He can't make any money off of his idea because somebody independently happened to get the same idea and get to the patent office first, which is just absolutely ridiculous. I believe that if we had no copyright laws whatsoever and no patent laws, then people in private business who are selling intellectual property, whether it's in the form of entertainment like songs or books or whatever it might be, would develop ways of protecting that property without having to rely on the government and relying on the force of government and, re and relying on the threatening of people with fines and imprisonment. I can't tell you what those methods would be, but on this show a couple of times I've used as the example people who let you have a demo uh, version of a software program. Yeah. They will send you a CD and you load in your computer and you've got a fully operated program, but at the end of 30 days it'll suddenly stop working. Well, that's one of the main things I was thinking of because on a company that makes money primarily off information, not physical property like Microsoft, you know, anybody can make a CD for 50 cents, but what Microsoft is selling is the information on the CD. So you're saying that if the government wasn't there to catch Microsoft back every time somebody tried to copyright them, that they would, incre they would create better encryption and so forth that would make it much more difficult for yes. people the, to copy their CDs. Yes, the necessity would be the mother of invention, as they yeah. say. And as long as the copyright laws exist, then, of course, people rely on it. Now, obviously, there are questions that come up. Well, how are you going to provide the kind of protection I gave as an example? How are you going to provide that kind of protection in, in a book, for instance? Yeah. Uh, obviously, I don't know the answer to that. But I also know that that doesn't mean that it's impossible. What we cherish very much in the free market is something that Frederick Hayek stressed so uh, much was that there is so much knowledge in the world, and if you ask the government to make the decisions, then you are relying on a very minuscule portion of all the knowledge that exists in the world. And they will make their decision based on that very, very, very limited knowledge that is available to the government, and then it is set in stone, and anybody who disagrees goes to jail or pays a huge fine, and if there's something better that could come along in the world, it just will not be able to get through the gates. But when you have a free market in ideas, then the most impossible job suddenly attracts the best thinkers in the world who could make a great deal of money by solving that impossible problem. And that's why, the way things get done. I mean, who would have thought 25 years ago that you could put movies on a little 7-inch disc mm -hmm. and stick it in a $100 machine and watch a whole movie at home? We had I, I, videotapes I think, yeah. and so on. But, no, but what if the government was in charge of all that? Do you think we would have that today? Not bloody likely. I think a good point uh, to make is that the, the government, even though they're supposedly enforcing the copyright laws, you know, anybody can get a Windows 98 CD copied for free. The, the, I mean, the government, you know, if there were some all-powerful benevolent agency, sure, the copyright laws would work, but because they're the government and they're basically incompetent, you know, the only thing stopping, that's not stopping me from shooting a heroin is the drug laws, you know. It's the fact that I don't want to. If yes. I want to do, anybody can get it. Yes, it's more prevalent now than it was when uh, drugs were completely legal. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, that's pretty much it. I'll let you get some other people, but uh, I usually miss your show, so I'm glad I caught it tonight. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you did, too, and I appreciate you calling in. All right. Thanks. All right. Me. I received an email from another Steve. We've had an abundance of Steves this evening. He's in Jackson, Tennessee. And he says, as I listen to your comment on the show, I find myself disagreeing with much, if not most, of what you have to say. First, you opine that all men are driven by an unquenchable desire for things. I assume this is what you mean when you say that all men have unmet desires. Personally, I find that I am quite content. I do have a job, and that job provides for my needs. My wife would tell you that the last few birthdays or Christmas holidays when she has asked what I wanted, I've had to frankly admit that I have no wants. God has blessed me richly, and I really don't find myself in a quest for unmet desires. Certainly not any that would be met by money. Just for the record, I make under $80,000 per year. Well, that's very interesting. What you're talking about is contentment. But I didn't say that all the desires were for things. The desires are for concepts, things, ideas, anything that you can't have. What you're saying is that you never think, gosh, I've got to get around to cleaning up the garage, or I've got to get around to reorganizing the things in the attics, and when am I going to get the time to go out and trim those shrubs in the backyard? And when am I going to have time to do this? And, gee, I wish that my children could go to a better school than they do because they're not getting the kind of education they should. And, boy, if I only had more time, I'd spend some time with them and try to make up for what they're not getting in school. And also, I probably should spend more time in civic activities and on and on and on and on. There are always unmet desires. I'm sorry, you're talking about contentment. Well, I'm contented with my life, too. I have a wonderful wife. I live in a wonderful neighborhood, and I live in a wonderful state, I believe, compared to the other states in the country. I have a wonderful music system in my office so that I can listen to the, my favorite kinds of music all day and everything. But do you think that I don't have desires and wishes for things that I don't have? 
And by things, I don't just mean better furniture or better car or anything of the sort. There are all sorts of things that I don't have time to do to take care of. There are all sorts of things that we don't have the money to take care of. There are all sorts of things in life. And that is the nature of being alive. We were instilled as human beings with this desire to continually replace one condition with a better condition. And that is the nature of human action, is a seeking to make things better, either in the short term or the long term, either physically or psychically, either in terms of ideas or in terms of material things, whatever it may be. And that is the nature of life, and it is the basis of economics. Economics is the science of trying to figure out how to satisfy the most urgent desires with the limited resources available, how to even identify what the most urgent desires are. It applies to us as individuals, and it also applies to a nation. And what happens, of course, at the national level is that the politicians just squander our money on something they think is important but isn't the most urgent and important thing to us, and we all lose as a result of it because they get their way at our expense. I got an email from Kayleen in Massachusetts who said that she has a medical condition which restricts her movement, and it is preventing anyone from hiring her. For the last 20 years, she has been a nursing assistant, and her medical condition, which affects her walking and standing ability, has really gotten in the way of anybody hiring her as a nursing assistant. And she says, I would love to hear what you have to say about this situation. Well, certainly, this creates a problem in being a nursing assistant. And this is one of the continual problems, is that as progress takes place in the world, we find that the nature of the jobs that are available because of the desires that people have are constantly changing. And at the same time, we also have the situation that our own conditions change. Whereas you were able to be a nursing assistant before, now you're not able to be a nursing assistant. And as each of us grows older, we are able to do some things that we couldn't do when we were younger, but we're also not able to do some things that we were able to do when we were younger. It's not very likely that a sports star is going to be able to continue in his career past 40 years old. So it's, he's got to hope that he made a lot of money then so that he has time to retrain for something else or maybe even retire if he made a whole bunch of money. And I think that Joe's point that he made earlier was very, very important, that he is working in a job today that didn't even exist 10 or 15 years ago, and that is he is making a living by selling products on eBay. And to Kayleen, I would suggest exploring every possibility you can for the kinds of things that you can do that fit your present situation, not what your situation was 5, 10, or 20 years ago. And fortunately, telecommuting today and using the computer is opening up all kinds of possibilities to people who are shut in, to people who are in remote areas of the country, who are people who couldn't take ordinary jobs. And I think maybe if you go to a bookstore or just search on Amazon, you may find some books that will suggest careers that you can get into very, very quickly these days using a computer. And I dwell on that particular example because it is an example of the way the world works, that things are continually changing, and part of the problem with unemployment is that people refuse to accept the idea that the demand no longer exists for the things that they were doing before and that they need to adapt to new situations. We also got an interesting insight from Eugene, who mentioned that we shouldn't be thinking so much in terms of jobs and wage rates, but rather the fact that what we are looking for is the wealth that we can have, the things that we can enjoy, and so forth. And and so the level of the wages is not important because the level of prices may make those wages either more valuable or less valuable than they might seem on the surface. And that what we are looking for is not to create as many jobs as possible, but to raise the standard of living overall. And lastly, another point that came up in a conversation with one of the Steves was that a lot of libertarians believe in free trade but are very strongly opposed to immigration at least unlimited immigration. And you have to realize that it doesn't make any difference whether an Italian makes his shoes in Italy or he makes them in Akron, Ohio. It is the same thing that some foreigner is making shoes. And if free trade is all right, then free immigration ought to be all right, and vice versa. But most important, we need not to be swayed by the demagogues who are always trying to show us the bloody obvious, put it right in front of our faces and say, how can you deny this? No, those Mexicans are not lowering our standard of living. It's the government that's lowering our standard of living. Please join me again next week. This is Harry Brown. Have a good week. 